Okay, so I'm back talking to you about section 12.1. I was almost done in that last video and I just had just a little bit more to do. You all might notice I can only do 15 minute increments and maybe that's all you want to listen to at once anyway, but um, I have a couple more things to say about section 12.1. So I'm back on your second, or I guess it's the last page of your notes there for 12.1. Um, okay, so we talked about how there's four different types of averages and, and, and a company could say, hey, we pay an average of $45,000 a year, and then the union could say, no, the average is only $40,000 a year. We need a raise, is, would be making their point, and the company would be saying, hey, we're doing pretty well. We've got this number. So they can both be right. Uh, it just depends on which type of average they're computing. So you need to ask deeper questions about it. Um, we talked about how the mode is the most common number used. So the mode salary might be good, like what do most people make? That's the mode. The median is the middle, what's the middle person making? If you went from the lowest to the highest salary, who's the person in the middle? The, so that's the median. And then the mid-range adds the extreme. So it's it's very much affected by extreme values. If you've got someone making a million dollars, say the CEO of the company makes a million, but most people are making minimum wage, if you do a mid-range, it's going to look like the average uh, salary is like, I don't know, fifty thousand dollars or something an hour, whatever. I, don't, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't even say a number because I don't know. But it would look really big. It would certainly not uh, represent what's going on for the what we would think um, represents what's going on average-wise. Okay, but it would be a true average, mid-range again, lowest and highest divided by two. Um, so, which would be if say minimum wage, let's just call it ten dollars. So, if we did ten dollars an hour. Oh, I guess I can erase this from the last video. So if we did $10 an hour, um, and then another person was making, say, $500 an hour, the mid-range would take the lowest amount made to the highest amount made, because I'm doing this on a per hour basis, and divide that by two. So it would be 510 divided by two, which is, um, A lot, right? Not really what's happening there. 255. $255 an hour would be an actual average. They could say, on average, our employees make $255 an hour here and be telling the truth because mid-range is a type of average. Um, the other type of average, the one you normally think of, I think most people think when I say I'm going to average your grades, I'm going to add up all your test scores and divide by, say there's four tests, divide by four. So if we were doing a, a mean average, it would be a more representative um, number at least. We would add up everybody's uh, hourly wage there at that company and divide by how many employees there were. And it would be better, but still an extreme value would skew the results, make it not as representative. All right, so that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about. Um, next uh, comment on your note packet is another vague word is largest. When someone says, we have the largest department store in the U.S., does that mean they have the largest profit-wise, the largest in sales, the largest building, uh, the largest number of employees, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look up just what is the largest city in the United States, it depends on what you're asking, the largest population, the largest um, land size and the largest number of companies, the largest tallest buildings, it can mean a lot of things. So you need to be more specific in your question um, to really get that to the meat of it. It says in general though, no, people just hear what they want to hear. I mean, I absolutely do that. When I'm trying to make my point, I, I would just loosely probably use that and go with what worked for my case. So I think that's generally what you see happening. So you do have to go deeper if you really want to know something, ask the deeper questions. Exactly, largest in what way do you mean? Um, tallest buildings or so on. Another deceptive technique is used to state a claim from which the public may draw irrelevant conclusions. Now this is the most common one in advertising. Every company wants you to buy their stuff and so they're loosely um, using their data to make you think that it's going to help you with whatever situation you're having. And we do jump to extra conclusions. They're not always at fault. We need to take some of the responsibility there. But um, if a company states, for example, a disinfector 
disinfectant manufacturer claims that its product is absolutely the best and you need to have it or you're not going to be healthy, you need to look a little deeper. Uh, say it says it kills 40,760 germs in a laboratory in five seconds. I mean, that sounds pretty good to me. But does this actually mean that it works on da-da-da? Or does it kill the common cold? Um, am I going to be healthy from this? Are there other effects? Yada, yada. So we do jump to conclusions from the advertising, and sometimes we jump to irrelevant conclusions, and, and there's just a gazillion of those. I'll try to send you some on email, um, YouTube videos. There's lots of things on there with, uh, if you Google, like um, manufactured claims and misinterpretations or something, and you can find plenty of those examples, and I'm sure you've experienced many. And lastly, the main one, um, mathematically, that's easiest to um, kind of show in this section is a visual deception by using scaling in graphs and charts. So we live in a world uh, where graphs and charts um, are just very readily available in all magazines and it's very helpful to us because it helps us see data visually. So it's very helpful, it's a great thing. But we need to be a savvy consumer and also know some of the tricks of the trade there that, can, uh, that we can watch out for. So normally when you did the graphing chapter back in uh, chapter six uh, before, regular algebraic graphing, which you would expect maybe applies to all, but if we're doing normal algebraic graphing, we have our xy axis. Uh, you're like, don't show me that again, we already did that. But normally we have an xy axis and we start at the origin, which is the point zero, zero, and we have zero and we go one, two, three, four, five, and negative one, and then we scale it the same way, this way, one, two, three. So we're kind of used to that's typical graphing, how the graph looks. But when you jump into um, the real world, I guess, of graphing and charts, um, the rules kind of change there. Um, and actually, you can scale the graph however makes your point. You can um, make a graph that doesn't necessarily start at zero. It can start at seven if you want it to. Um, my, my, my examples I have here would be a scaling example. You can start at one and count by ones if you want to, or you can start, and I kind of started at zero here, but you don't have to. You can start at um, whatever number you want uh, and just say, my first tick mark is gonna be at 10, and then I'm gonna count by tens, 10, 20, 30, and so on. Now you do kind of have to keep it up, you know, you need to, whatever you choose to be your scaling, stay with that, be consistent, but you can choose your own scaling. You can count by ones, count by tens, count by a thousand. However, makes your point the best and fits on your screen the best. Um, and then over here, I started at, I called this 10, and then I counted by ones, 10, 11, 12, 13. So I would keep that up, 14 and so on. So I can count by ones, I can count by fives, whatever makes your point the best. So let's say that a company gave a $1 an hour raise. In March of 2019, say company, whatever, was paying people $10 an hour. So we could say, with a bar graph, which we'll talk more about later, we could make a bar around that date, March 19, uh, 2019, and say employees made $19 an hour. Remember, they're getting a $1 raise in March of 2020. So you're not going to even be able to see that, really. Um, and I tried to draw it so perfectly. There would be 10 tick marks here between 10 and 20. Um, and so a dollar raise would get me up to 11. Well, you're hardly going to be able to notice that. You know, it should be a little taller than this, but with my scaling, it should not be noticeable. It shouldn't look like much happened there in this uh, picture. But if I wanted to say, hey, I'm doing a good job. You got a dollar raise. That's great. Let's celebrate. It looks like a lot happened in this demonstration. So I could count again by ones if I preferred to make it look like a bigger difference. And then from March, same data, from March 2019 and March 2020, you got your dollar raise. So with this scaling, to get from $10 to $11, you know, I've made it look bigger. Absolutely legal within the, the rules of making charts and graphs, you can do that. So just be aware that um, of the scaling. Notice the scaling. They want to make it look like a big difference. You, you use smaller scaling at the vertical scale, and that will do that. It's the same data, but we just need to be aware of that. Um, so, and, and I made that point in your, in your notes here, um, 
just be sure you watch your increments. His scale with large increments is not as noticeable. Uh, one more example, um, you have this in your book. And I always encourage you, do look at your book. It has better visuals than I make on here too. It's actually a pretty good read as far as math goes. You, you might find it um, more helpful. Hopefully you've been looking at that. They have good applications, real time, a little history in there, so I always enjoy that. Um, let's see, what is this showing? I'm on page 730 for this example, and it's a, a scaling example of a stock. Yeah, that's what it did. It was talking about stock A and stock B. And if you do stock A, um, and actually on page 729, they do it with a more um, a graphing dotting example and showing it as a line. Um, and then on page 730, they do the bar graph idea. They just kind of squiggle this out and say, I'm going to start at 95, and I'm going to count by the ones, one, two, three, four, five, to get up to 100. So it's going to make it look like a bigger difference. And I've got 2013, it was at $95 a share. And then at 2014, it went up to $100 a share. So that scaling makes it look like, hey, that's great. Look at that growth. It's so much bigger. Um, and then the other graph, which is, I'm just making the same point I made with a different example, said I'm going to start um, at zero and go zero and then count by 20s, 20, 40, 60, 80. Oh, I need to make that bigger if I'm going to get up to 100 on it. 80, 100, and then we keep counting by 20, and we'll say 2013, 95. The same data would be, you know, a little above that 80 mark, like between uh, a little below the 100. We'd have to really draw it out and use a ruler to get it exactly, so don't judge yourself on that, or don't judge me on that, you know, but 95, if that's 80 and that's 100, 90 would be right in the middle, and then 95 would be a little higher than that. But you're not going to be able to tell much is happening if my scaling is counting this way, and if um, and then to get up to 100 is just a little over that, you know, 2014 at 100. And so that just makes the point that the scaling really does matter. And again, do look at your book, or even um, maybe you're doing this as you've been going through our course. If, um, you know, YouTube videos, they're just um, there's one there's one for everything that you could possibly want to know. So you can look online to kind of see some other examples um, of some scaling. Just any topic that we're on, you might top in and get a YouTube video that explains it has better graphics and visuals to kind of show that. So hope this helps. Best wishes.